Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it. We thank you. You're bringing revelation of it. We are walking in the light of it, and we are conquering and overcoming in all areas. Thank you for what you accomplished this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you on conquering in many areas and specifically talking about conquering sin. We talked about what is sin. We talked about the effects of sin. And we went through the last two sessions on how to conquer sin. And as we conquer it, we will see God's work be accomplished in us to bring us to perfection and to bring us to the place of abiding in Him, knowing Him, having eternal life. And the message this morning was certainly very important. If you haven't heard it, you ought to consider watching it. It was very important for everybody to hear. Tonight we're going to talk about conquering unrighteousness and lawlessness. And this is mandatory because only the righteous are going to be with the Father in the eternal age. And the ones that are the lawless ones or the unrighteous are going to hear, depart from me. Well, we can't have that happen in our life, so we're going to conquer all unrighteousness and all lawlessness in our life. We begin in Revelation 21, 7 again. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. I will be his God and he shall be my people. The word overcome, nakao, means to conquer and carry off the victory. This is something that is expected of every one of us, not just once in a while, but ongoingly. We bring up information in the lower window and point out what it is to explain things that, that are important. This is a present tense verb. The present tense in the Greek means continuous, ongoing, repeated action. So this is talking about someone who is conquering continually and carrying off the victory. That's what God wants, and that's what He'll accomplish for us in our life. And we will inherit all things, and we will see victory come forth. We must conquer all unrighteousness and lawlessness. Well, how did this all start? Well, it all started with the enemy who was formerly the one who was in heaven leading the praise and worship. It was Lucifer. We see in Ezekiel chapter 28, in verse 15, just speaking of him, Thou was perfect in thy ways, thy ways from the day that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. This word iniquity is this word, avel in the Hebrew, and it means unrighteousness. You'll see this one, number 5766, which corresponds to the Strong's Concordance numbers, numbering system. He was, unrighteousness was found in him. <laughs> that was the end for him. He ended up, of course, being cast as profane out of the mountain of God. And we see that he says, by the merchandise of thy, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. He sinned against God. And because of that, he was kicked out of heaven. He goes on in verse 18, Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, again, of all his perverseness, and by the iniquity or the unrighteousness of thy traffic, therefore will I bring a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. The destruction is set for the enemy. Lucifer's name was changed to Satan, and he now, of course, was cast out. And now he is the adversary and his destination is set. We must realize that after the fall of man, where Satan was in position of authority operating in the earth and man was under his dominion, of course, Jesus Christ came in order to accomplish the redemption to liberate us so we could be born again and be come back into relationship with the Father, which has happened, praise God. At the same time, we must get rid of all unrighteousness and lawlessness out of our life and be right with Him. We see in Job 15, verse 16, quite a statement made. How much more abominable and filthy is man which drinketh unrighteousness. Iniquity is this word, number 5766, unrighteousness, like water. He's taking unrighteousness in like water because unrighteousness is sin. If we walk in sin, we are taking unrighteousness in. God does not want us to have unrighteousness in our life. 
Sin is unrighteousness. We see this from 1 John chapter 5, verse 17. All unrighteousness is sin. Uh, we must conquer all sin, and we've talked about that. As we conquer all sin, we will eliminate all unrighteousness. <coughs> As we walk in line with the Word, doing the Word of righteousness, we will see the fruits of righteousness in our life. We see oh, back over in Job. Job chapter 11, in verse 14. If iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away. God wants us to get rid of it. Let not wickedness, unrighteousness again is what the word actually is, dwell in thy tabernacles. No unrighteousness is to dwell in us. We are to only have the fruits of righteousness. We are to be walking uprightly before the Lord and, and come to the place of being holy before him. It's not to be in us. We're to put it far away. If we have it in us, we see in Psalms 58, here in verse 2, he says, Yea, in heart, you work unrighteousness. Again, this number. The King James does not translate things consistently, unfortunately. But, as again, if you notice this number, 5766, which means unrighteousness. In heart, they were working unrighteousness. That shows you it's a heart problem. It's not just us yielding to something. If we yield to it, we're our heart has obviously given place to that which is not of the Lord and righteousness. Of course, what's the answer? The answer is to repent, return unto Him, and overcome and conquer everything. In Job chapter 22, verse 23, If thou return to the Almighty, that would mean repentance in our life, thou shalt be built up. God will work to build us up. Thou shalt put away unrighteousness far from thy tabernacles. God wants you to put it all away. Anything that is not of him needs to be put away and eliminated out of your life. Now unrighteousness is something that a person can do. In Leviticus chapter 19, over here in verse 15, you shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. And then it talks about ways that people can do it. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. No, we're not going to have respect to persons or be honoring someone uh, that, that's an evil type of a person, whatever, or somebody that is supposed to be a, a great person or whatever all. We're supposed to treat everybody the same according to the word of God. In righteousness thou shalt judge thy neighbor. Otherwise, we're going to look at everything through the eyes of righteousness. And you know them by their fruits, remember, and that's the fruits of righteousness if they're the true the things of God coming forth. Otherwise, it would be evil things. We see over in Psalms, chapter 82, Psalms 82, we see in verse 2, How long will you judge unjustly? and accept the persons of the wicked. We can't be judging in unrighteousness. And accept the persons of the wicked, we're to be separate from people that are not walking right. We witness to them and preach the gospel to them and call them to, to receive Jesus or come to repentance, but we must judge things correctly in line with righteousness, not unjustly in our life. We also see, if we do righteousness, Quite a statement is made in Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 16. For all that do such things and all that do unrighteously are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. That means anybody that's walking in sin, which is what unrighteousness is, that means we're an abomination unto him. We've got to be sure that we're dealing with everything in our life and making sure we're walking in his ways. If not, you could be building the wrong things in your life. You know, we're supposed to build the things of God by hearing and doing His Word. But we see a scripture over here in Jeremiah 22, verse 13. Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness. You know, some people, they build their house by things that are wrong, contrary to God's Word. Oh, it might look like it's okay, but it's not. We cannot build things with unrighteousness.
his chambers by wrong, he uses neighbor's service without wages and give him his first work. We gotta make sure that we're only doing what is righteous before the Lord. And we gotta be sure also, as we see over in John chapter seven, verse 18, he that speaketh of himself seeks his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Well, that means if we're speaking of ourselves, that would be out of pride. And we're seeking our glory just to build us up. Well, that produces unrighteousness, that's sin. Because we are to deny ourselves. But if we seek his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness will be in him. We're going to seek the Lord. We're going to put him first place in all things. And we're not going to have any unrighteousness in us whatsoever. Unrighteousness is also something that you can obey if you yield to it. In Romans chapter 2, in verse 8, speaking here of those that see judgment come upon them, unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, which would be the word, but obey unrighteousness, this is the word adikia, meaning unrighteousness in the Greek and the Old, New Testament, what's going to happen to them? Indignation and wrath and tribulation and anguish. Well, those are judgments that come. God doesn't want that. He wants us to be blessed. But if we are obeying the unrighteousness and not obeying the truth, these are the things that will happen in a person's life. We also must realize that our tongue is so important because you can be releasing evil things through your mouth if you speak wrong words. Verse 6 of James 3. James 3, verse 6, the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. Iniquity means unrighteousness. So is the tongue among our members. It defileth the whole body. It can defile you by what you're speaking and sets on fire the course of nature, and it's set on fire of hell. Now you're yielding to the enemy, and his works are going to be accomplished. We must learn to watch our tongue. <coughs> verse 9, well, if we go back, verse 9, he says, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. We can't be speaking negative things against people and cursing them. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. We should only be speaking blessing and not cursing. We need to speak the right things before the Lord. Back in Job, he makes the statement of what he will do in Job 27 in verse 4. My lips shall not speak wickedness or unrighteousness. You need to purpose. You're not going to speak things contrary to what the Word says. You're not going to speak unrighteousness or evil things. Nor my tongue utter any kind of deceit, anything that's contrary to the Word. We're only going to speak right things at all times. That means that we've got to make sure we're yielding ourselves to what is right. In Romans chapter 6, verse 13, it speaks about our members, and our members would be all of our faculties, not only our tongue, but also what we hear, what we see, what we put our hands to, what we're walking in, what we're thinking upon in our mind. It says in Romans 6, 13, neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness. Otherwise, we can't let ourselves be any, any instrument or a vessel for unrighteousness. What's that produce? It produces sin unto sin. But you're to yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members, all of your faculties as instruments of righteousness to God. I only want to hear what's righteous. I only want to see what's righteous. I only want to be thinking on what's righteous. I only want to be speaking what is righteous. I only want to be in fellowship with those that which is righteous. I don't want to have any of this other stuff. And these are commands, by the way. This is not try your best. These are imperative mood verbs commanding us. And a present tense means it's ongoing. We are continually commanded to yield our members not to unrighteousness, but instead we are to yield ourselves unto God. God's not going to make you do things you're going to choose to do things. He set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. He tells you, of course, to choose life. 
We need to yield ourselves to obedience to do the things that God wants us to do. Now what happens if we obey things that are contrary to the word? Down in verse 19. He says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity or the weakness of your flesh. And remember, we talked about sin dwells in the flesh. We cannot be walking in the flesh, otherwise we'll be yielding to sin, which is unrighteousness. For as you have yielded your members, all your faculties, servants to uncleanness and to, it says iniquity here, this is the word lawlessness, anomia, it produces more lawlessness. So we can't be yielding our, mem our members to anything that's unclean, that would be unrighteous, or anything that's contrary to God's laws, it produces more lawlessness. Even so, now yield your members' servants to righteousness. What does that produce? Holiness. God's commanded us to be holy as He is holy. How are we going to be holy? Because we're going to yield our members' servants to righteousness. We're going to obey the word of righteousness that produces the fruits of righteousness that brings forth holiness in our life. In the last days when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he's going to speak against the things of God. And as he speaks against these things, he's going to be bringing forth everything that is unrighteous and speaking against that which is righteous. Look at how he's going to be operating in verse 10 of 2 Thessalonians 2. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness, it's deceiving. Sin is deceiving, remember. All deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that are perishing. Yeah, these guys are perishing if you're walking in unrighteousness because this is a present tense, meaning they're on that road continually of perishing if they're yielding to righteousness, and it's all deception from sin. And why is it, why would someone get deceived into unrighteousness? Well, what's the source of, of righteousness? It's the Word. You get deceived in unrighteousness if you don't receive the love of the truth. We must receive the love of the truth, and the truth is the Word of God, putting the Word first place, hearing and doing it. For they're being saved. That'll produce the salvation of the Lord in your life. He goes on and he says, For this cause, because they don't receive the love of the truth, and they're walking in unrighteousness, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, which will be they're going to believe that the Antichrist, who's going to declare he's God, is who he is. He's a liar, of course, and they're deceived. But God will let you choose anything you want. If you don't walk in his ways, then... They can, he'll send a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned or judged, this means, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That means things that are unrighteous will bring pleasure unto you. Well, that's why we can't allow that to go on. God wants you to stay away from things. Sexual sin, doing all these kind of evil kind of things. No, we should have nothing to do with it whatsoever. Unrighteousness works through deception. We cannot be deceived. You will not be deceived if you walk in line with the Word of God, and that is so important. That's why we must realize that we can't be serving things that are not of Him. Titus chapter 3 talks about these, these diverse pleasures. We ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures. No, we're not going to walk after those living in malice, envy, hateful, and hating one another. That cannot be happening whatsoever in our life. We are now to walk in the ways of righteousness. Of course, we see that people that walk in sin, what does it do? It does produce these pleasures of unrighteousness. Hebrews 11.25, this is talking here about how Moses made the right choice instead of wanting to just follow along being in the house of Pharaoh. No, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction of the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. No, we're not going to walk in those ways. We're going to walk in obedience to the Lord. Now what happens if you walk in the ways of sin? We see Acts chapter 8, over here in verse 23. This is where, if we go back, this is where he was wanting to buy, this is after uh, Peter had ministered 
the Holy Spirit to those ones who are from Samaria here. And Simon saw through the laying on of hands that the apostles, uh, the, uh, the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered him money. He wanted to buy this ability to lay hands on people and give the Holy Spirit to people. He said, give me this power that whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. He said, thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought the gift of God may be purchased with money. You can't buy these things. Just think of all these preachers out there that have said, send me your thousand dollars and all, you'll get your new house or you'll get your healing or whatever. You can't buy things with money. <laughs> it's ridiculous. They have manipulated and done contrary to the word of God. He said, you're, you've not either part nor lot in this matter. Your heart's not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God that perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven you. I perceive you're in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of unrighteousness, is the word, adakia. He was in the bond. He was in bondage to unrighteousness. We must come out of all sin, or you will be in bondage to unrighteousness. It will hold you in bonds. It will hold you captive. We must come out of it and not allow it to happen. There's also, if you keep yielding to it, just like there's fruits of righteousness, there's also fruits of unrighteousness. Here we see these guys over in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. They forsook the right way. They've gone astray. They're following the way of Balaam. And they love the wages of unrighteousness. All the, the things that came forth, the fruits and the ble blessings of unrighteousness, of doing evil things. Um, we cannot walk in those ways whatsoever. We've got to turn away from them. Now, we must also realize that you can be born again, yet you can be filled with unrighteousness. These guys who turned away and rejected the way of the Lord, even as they didn't like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, that's an unapproved mind, to do those things that are not convenient. And then it begins to tell you what they got filled with, filled with all unrighteousness. And it begins to list out all these things. Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers. These are all things that are unrighteous in God's sight. Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. This is all evil. These people were filled with unrighteousness, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, means that these ones were, they, you couldn't trust their word, they, weren't, they wouldn't enter into any kind of agreement on anything. They were unmerciful towards others. Knowing the judgment of God, those that commit such things are worthy of death. They all not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. See, unrighteousness is deceitful. And it, you'll, you'll enjoy doing unrighteousness, but it will lead you down a path of destruction. We see back in verse 18, what's going to happen? For those people that are not walking in God's ways, wrath will come upon them. Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. It's going to be revealed against it. There is a judgment that comes. When it says who hold the truth in unrighteousness, that doesn't make sense because you don't hold the truth, which is the word, in unrighteousness. The word hold means really to hold down, as Young's brings it forth, to hold down or hold back the truth in unrighteousness. You see, if you're walking in the word, you won't walk in unrighteousness. But if you're walking contrary to it, then not doing the truth, then you must be doing unrighteousness. And, of course, what's going to happen? 1 Corinthians chapter 6 even tells us the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. He says so in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not the unrighteous? They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. See, some people think if you're born again, you'll just automatically inherit the kingdom of God regardless of what you do. Now, this, is, this makes that show that's not true. Be not deceived. The fornicators, the idolaters, the adulterers, the effeminate. This is the abusers of themselves with mankind. This is a homosexual 
one who lies with male as with a female. Those are homosexuals. Thieves, covetous, drunkards, or intoxicated ones, revilers, extortioners, they shall not inherit, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God whatsoever. But destruction is going to come upon them. We must not let any of these things get a hold of us. Now, we also see quite a statement made over in Luke chapter 13. Unrighteousness must be cleansed out of our life. In Luke chapter 13, a statement was made to the Lord in verse 23. One of them said, Lord, are there few that be saved? Why would he say that? Because he was teaching the fact that only the ones are going to be right with him are the ones are going to be saved. He said, strive. This word strive is the word agonizomai in the Greek, which means to contend with adversaries and fight. It's the same word translated fight in 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. You and I are going to be fighting and contending with the adversary to enter in at the straight, narrow gate. Narrow is the way, the way of the word. But for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, but they shall not be able, they shall not have spiritual strength and might and power to do it. It takes that in order to conquer and overcome the enemy. And that comes from the word in you. This is many it's talking about. They aren't going to be able to enter in. Why? Because they're walking the wrong way. And he says, once the master of the house has risen up and is shut to the door, and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. He shall answer and say unto you, I know you not from whence, or this more literally means from where you are. And the word are here means where they were continually. Present tense, where they were continually. And when he talks about, I know you not, this is a statement he's making looking at what their life was like. Because it is a perfect tense verb. The way you translate a perfect tense is you would translate it, I have known. Because it's referring to action completed in the past, with present results at the time of speaking. Whenever you see a perfect tense, it's very significant. So he's saying, that's why Young's translates, it, but I have not known you from where you continually are. Well, that means they must not have been following the way of the Lord anymore. They were now walking in their own way, contrary to the word. Then they begin to say, well, we've eaten and drunk in thy presence. You taught in our streets. They heard the, the word of God. They were in the presence of God before. But he shall say, I tell you, I have not known again, he's saying. Because how does God know you? By what your track record continually is in your life. Not by what you did at one point in time. But by what you've done on an ongoing basis, which shows where you are now. And that's why it's the perfect tense. I have not known you from where you are continually. And so what's he saying? Depart from me, you, all you workers of unrighteousness, adikia. If we're a worker of unrighteousness, we're not going to be saved. We're going to be sent out. He's going to say, depart from me. We cannot have that whatsoever. We cannot be workers of unrighteousness. That means we must walk in the ways of the Lord and be obedient to him. Many people have not understood this. In fact, they, they've thought that, well, I thought if I'm born again, that it doesn't matter, you know, what all I do, everything, I'll still make it. Well, not so, as you will see. Look at Ezekiel 18. They took offense with what he said here, but it's the truth that was brought forth. In Ezekiel 18, verse 20, it says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Well, it means he's walking in unrighteousness. He's not going to, he's going to be seeing death. The wages of sin is death. The son shall not bear, this word bear means to lift, to be able to lift off, essentially, the iniquity. This would be all the perverseness of the father. Neither shall the father bear or lift the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. Well, that would be because he's doing the word of righteousness. He'll be righteous. It'll be shown on him from the fruits of righteousness. 
and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him, contrasting righteousness with wickedness. Now, many people have missed the whole boat about what this is verse talking about. Many people have tried to say, this is talking about inherited generational iniquity curses, that they don't come on you. Because they've taken this part of the verse out of context, thinking it means the son shall not bear or would come down to him the iniquity of the father. I've had people bring this to me and say, Ezekiel 18.20 says we can't have an inherited generational curse. It says the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. So it can't come down the line. Well, they didn't look at the word bear and understand it's not talking about it coming down the line. It's talking about lifting it off. Furthermore, you know it's not talking about inherited generational because what's the next part? You can't leave the rest of the part and lift part of it out of the verse and make a doctrine out of it. The father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. If it's talking about something coming down the inheritance line, the son is affected by the iniquity of the father, right? Well, is the father affected by the iniquity of the son? No, they don't go up. <laughs> I'd be affected by the father's sins, the par parent's sins, right? So this isn't talking about that at all. Instead, it's talking about the son can't get rid of the iniquity of the father, and the father can't get rid of the iniquity of the son. Each one's responsible for what they do. The righteousness of the righteous is upon him. Now, that means if you and I are walking in righteousness, we're going to be shown to be righteous. The wickedness of the wicked, though, will be upon him. He says, if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he's committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he's going to be doing righteousness. He's doing what's right. He shall surely live. He shall not die because he repented and he turned from them. And he's now walking in righteousness. All his transgressions, all the sins and wrong things he did, his rebellion and disobedience that he's committed, they shall not be, it says, mentioned. This is a word which means remembered. They will not be remembered or recalled unto him. Well, that's good news. Isn't that exactly what happens? The Lord will wash our sins away and as if they never were. In his righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Well, that's good. Well, we come down to verse 24, and he says the other thing, though. When the righteous, the guy who was walking right, turneth away from his righteousness, and he commits iniquity now, unrighteousness. He's walking in unrighteousness now. He's not walking in the way of the Lord anymore. And doeth according to all the abominations the wicked man doeth, shall he live? The answer is no. Doesn't matter if he was righteous at one point. All his righteousness that he has done shall not be remembered or called to mind. It didn't matter what he did in the past. It's what he's doing now, consistently, that counts. All his righteousness he has done shall not be remembered. In his trespass that he's trespassed, in his sin that he has sinned, in them shall he die. <laughs> this guy's not righteous any longer. Yet you say, the way of the Lord's not equal. They were complaining about that because they wanted, just because they were righteous at one point, that that should just carry over forever. No, it doesn't work that way. It's what you walk by consistently. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal, are not your ways unequal. <laughs> they hadn't been walking in the way of the Lord. They turned away from righteousness and were walking in sin. That is a way of destruction. And what happens for those ones who are walking in unrighteousness? 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Look at the statement that's made. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. He will, if we're walking in his ways. And to reserve the unjust. Well, these are the ones that are the unrighteous ones. The unrighteous ones are going to be reserved unto the day of judgment to be punished. If you're righteous, you'll be delivered, you'll be blessed. If you're unrighteous, God will keep that, reserve that person to a day of judgment to be punished. This is why we must conquer all unrighteousness in our life and turn away from it. We must also understand that we must deal with lawlessness as well. Lawlessness has to be eliminated. 
lawlessness. We already saw it. That's the word anomia. We see down here in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Whosoever commits or is doing sin, as Young's brings out, he is doing lawlessness. Let me show you this. Whoever is doing, this is the word poeo, which means to make or to do. Sin, that's the word for sin, is doing, it's, it uses poeo again, is doing, that's why Young's brings it out down here, lawlessness, which is anomia. So this is really the correct translation from the Greek. Everyone who is doing the sin, the lawlessness he's doing, because the sin is transgression of the law, which is lawlessness. If we're not doing the law, the commandments, of the law of Christ, the commandments of Jesus Christ, walking in his ways, then we're doing lawlessness. And that produces sin in our life, and we cannot have that. In fact, as we mentioned about the Antichrist coming on the scene, we looked at the verses from 10, verse 10 on, but let's go back for a moment. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, it says, The mystery of lawlessness, anomia, does already work. And then it talks about him as the lawless one. Then shall that wicked, but it's really the word anomos, the lawless one, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, he's going to be revealed. He's the lawless one. This is why. What do you see going on in the world today? You see all these people that they don't want to pay attention to law. Look at all these so-called leaders of ours. They're lawless as ever. <laughs> they got their own laws when they want to follow them, and they don't want to follow anybody else's laws. They're lawless ones. There are, the lawless spirit has been working, and when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he's the lawless one. He will be speaking against everything that's of God. And basically, a person can do anything they want. It'll increase. We cannot have anything to do with lawlessness. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Look what it says. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. This term, unequally yoked together, means to have fellowship with one who's not an equal. Spiritually, we're talking about. Am I going to have fellowship with someone who's not walking right? Who's walking in ungodliness, walking in unrighteousness, walking in lawlessness? No, not whatsoever. What fellowship has righteousness, which is what we're to be following after, with unrighteousness is what it says here in the King James. But again, it's the Greek word anomia, which means lawlessness. Can we have any fellowship with the lawless ones? No. You must turn away from all lawlessness. And why is that important? Because lawlessness, you think it's getting strong now, this is nothing compared to what it's going to see. It's going to abound. And it's going to affect Christians who are not putting the Word of God first place. This is in Matthew 24, end time chapter. Look what it says. Because iniquity, which is again this word anomia, because of lawlessness shall abound, or as Young's brings it out, the abounding of lawlessness. It's going to be abounding. People will just be walking in lawlessness continually. It's going to affect people if they're not putting the word first place. The love of many shall wax cold. Who's this talking about? Some people try to say that those are talking about the Jews. No, it's not. Love is agape love. Who has the agape love? Only those that are born again, not the world. The agape love of many, this is talking about many Christians, their love for God. Well, what? It'll wax cold. Well, that means they're in trouble. You can't have your love wax cold and think you're going to be right. Remember the lukewarm, they get spewed out of his mouth. What happens to the cold? They're in trouble for sure. The love of many shall wax cold. We cannot allow that. In fact, we've got to deal with all of the lawlessness. And lawlessness, you will see, you have to take a stand against it. Because lawlessness will work to even vex you by being around all that's going on. Look what it says. 
this is talking about with Lot. 2 Peter 2.7 Deliver just Lot, vexed with the filthy manner of life or conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their onomous deeds, their unlawful deeds. The, unlaw the unlawfulness, lawlessness is going to be increasing. And you'll be, you can hardly even stand to see it. You can't stand to see it now. <laughs> You're gonna, it's going to be much worse. It's going to be abounding. You can't let it affect you. You've got to preach the gospel to people, and you're going to stand up and make sure that you don't be following into any of the lawless ways. You've got to be ready to resist it. But it was vexing him from that. We cannot allow lawlessness. In fact, look at the statement made in Matthew 13. Verse 13, that is. Verse 41, which is talking about at the end of the age where the Son of Man will send forth his angels and shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do lawlessness. And do is talking about those who are doing it continually. You see, if you don't have the word first place in your life and you're not doing the word, you could be an easy candidate to be followed because sin is deceitful and unrighteousness is deceitful and leads you down a wrong path. It's talking about these ones who are doing continually lawlessness. What's going to happen to them? He's going to cast them in a furnace of fire. There's going to be wailing and gnashing of teeth. The lawless ones are not going to be saved. That's why, of course, if their love waxes cold, just as the lukewarm are spewed out, so are the other ones. They're going to be judged because they're not following the way of the Lord. And look at Matthew 7. We come to verse... 19, he says, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit, what would the fruit be from doing the word and fruits of righteousness? Is hewn down. He's cut down and cast into the fire. <laughs> we must have fruits of righteousness. Why will we have fruits of righteousness? Because we're doing the word of righteousness. We're walking in it, which is what we should be living by. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. That means just because you call him Lord doesn't mean you're going to enter in. It matters what kind of a walk you have. He that doeth, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Otherwise, who's going to enter in? The doers. And this is someone who is doing it continually, present tense. Doing the will of my Father which is in heaven. Then look at the next verse. Many will say to me in that day, when he's examining all these ones, Many will say, that's not a few, that's the many. The few are contrasted with the many in Scripture. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils? In thy name have done many wonderful works? Well, who's this talking about? There have been preachers by the multitudes out there that have tried to say, this is not talking about Christians. It sure is talking about Christians. Because could you prophesy in his name if you're not born again and have the Holy Spirit? No. Could you be casting out demons in his name if you're not born again and know your authority and be operating in it and casting demons out? No. Remember the seven sons of Sceva tried to cast them out and the demons overtook them and tore off their clothes and fled naked out of it. They couldn't do anything because they weren't born again and right. In thy name done many wonderful works. Could you do wonderful works if you're not right with God? Born again, Christian? This is clearly talking about Christians. Why have people said that? Because of the next verse. They just assume that this can't be talking about Christians because these guys at one time were doing these things. Notice, by the way, prophesied, past tense. Have cast out, past tense. Done, past tense. In the past, they did righteous things. Good things. Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Hmm. Remember, that's the same thing we saw in Ezekiel, where the guy who had turned from his righteousness, none of his righteousness was remembered anymore, and the sins he was committing, he was going to die. And now he says, I never knew you. Well, why would that be? 
because of what he's walking in at, the, at that time. He said, depart from me, you who, are, who work on a mere lawlessness. And when the work means, this is present tense, I mean these guys were walking right at one time, not anymore. Present tense, continuous, ongoing, working lawlessness. And what is, how does God see you? This is an important point for understanding who's saved, who's right with God. He sees you at any point in time but what, by what you're walking after consistently in your life. If you quit walking in the way of righteousness and now you're working, walking continually in unrighteousness or in lawlessness, well, that's the way he knows you. And that's why he says, I never knew you. He knows you by what your track record is consistently. And how do you know them? By your fruits. What's fruit come from? Fruit comes from hearing and doing something consistently. This is why you and I must make sure that we put the Word of God first place in our life. you got to know Jesus hates lawlessness. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9. When he's here, this is verse 8, when the Father said to the Son, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness, the scepter of thy kingdom, when he's enthroned and as king of kings and lord of lords in heaven. Thou hast loved righteousness. That's what you and I are to love. And hated anemia, lawlessness. Jesus hates lawlessness. You should hate lawlessness. Anything that causes you to walk contrary to God's word, you should hate it. If you hate it, you won't even touch it. You won't even let it be a part of you whatsoever. You'll get rid of that out of your life as well. We must do what he says and conquer it. Notice what it says over here in Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Speaking of what Jesus did, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us, or this means to release us. Now, when he says that he might, that doesn't mean it's already done because this is a subjunctive mood verb. The subjunctive mood verbs in the Greek express conditional statements. It is not a statement of fact that it's been done. It is a conditional statement that has to have conditions met for it to come to pass, meaning that he might release us from all lawlessness and purify, same thing, subjunctive mood, might purify unto himself a peculiar people. That's one that belongs to him, one that's one of his own, that he considers one of his possessions. A people who are zealous of good works. Oh, that means they're walking in the way of the Lord. So he gave himself for us so that he might free us and release us from all lawlessness, and he might purify unto himself a pure, peculiar people, well, it depends on what we do, doesn't it? If we do the Word of God, it'll get accomplished. If we don't do the Word of God, it won't get accomplished. We've got to show you a couple of scriptures that are important that have been highly misunderstood by the body of Christ because they didn't look up the tenses. Hebrews 8, 12. People quote this for believing the one saved, always saved, and say, well, this is, you know, he says, I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. See, it's all gone. Not so. When he says, I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawlessness, anemia, will I remember no more? That would be a future tense declaration statement that he won't ever remember them, period. It's not. When we look at this, this is not a statement that is a statement of fact. It's a subjunctive mood verb, meaning that he might remember the sins and lawlessness no more if you deal with them and get rid of them out of your life. You've got to walk in line with the Word of God. Same thing over in Hebrews 10, verse 17. And their iniquities, sins, and lawlessnesses, anemia, I might, again, subjunctive mood, remember no more if we conquer them and overcome them. 
That's important to know. In fact, here's another scripture that people have not understood that goes right along with this. You say, well, I thought God said he'll never leave us or forsake us. Well, that's the way it's translated in the King James. Is it right? No. Let your conversation be without covetous. Be content with such things you have. For he hath said, I will never leave you. Is that a future tense? And if it was a, fact, a statement of fact, it would be what's called the indicative mood in the Greek. It's, those are statements of facts made. No. It's a subjunctive mood, and it's not a future tense whatsoever. It literally says, I might never leave you if conditions are met. And I might never forsake you. Again, the same thing, subjunctive mood as long as you meet the conditions. Because, I mean, actually, we can tell. Remember when he says, depart from me? <laughs> well, that would be a contradiction. I'm never going to leave or forsake you, and how could he tell me, depart from me, or I never knew you, you know? Because they're not a contradiction. If you meet the conditions, he won't leave you or forsake you. Which means we've got to deal with all sin and lawlessness, all unrighteousness, has to be eliminated, and we can do it. We talked about it, how we conquer all sin, and how God will accomplish this great work to set us free from every bondage in our life. Now, this also deals with our heart. You're to have a perfect heart before God. Matthew 23, 28. Look what he says about these religious people. Even so, you also will outwardly appear righteous unto men. Oh, you look like you. everything's fine with you. Oh, we could look at every one of you and say, yeah, everybody, we all appear righteous to men. <laughs> Within, you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. It all comes down to what's in the heart. We, make, must have, we can't be hypocrites, say one thing and do another. I represent myself one way, but <laughs> behind closed doors or whatever, um, I'm a different person. That's hypocrisy. Or having lawlessness in my life, we can't have that whatsoever. It means that's on the inside, that would be in your heart. God's looking at everything in our life. We need to clean up all, everything, and make sure that on the inside we are right before the Lord. We also see in James chapter 2, verse 9, if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors, meaning you're a lawless one. You're con going contrary to the Word of God. We can't have respect to persons. We're going to love everybody. We're going to treat everybody right. We're not going to be having certain ones we treat, treat, treat right and other ones that we, we won't. Why? It says, Verse 12, so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. That's right. So we're going to speak and we're going to do what's right in line with the word of God because we will all be judged and we're all going to be standing before the judgment seat of Christ as it talks about. Also, things that you destroyed in your life, don't ever let them come back. Galatians 2, verse 18. If I build the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor, a lawbreaker. We can't be doing that. You conquer every enemy. People have said, well, I turn from it, then I seem to fall back into it. This is why deliverance is important. You need to get rid of all the demons that, are, that came into you from past sin that are trying to drive you to do evil things. Not only do you confess your sin and turn from it and, and resist it and get yourself filled up with the Word of God so you think correctly and choose correctly, but you also cast out the demons that are trying to drive you into, to, in, into captivity and to lead, yield to these things again. And then we see the scripture in 2 John. We saw this this morning. This is an important scripture. Whosoever transgresses or is a lawbreaker, he's walking contrary to the Word, and is abiding not in the doctrine of Christ, in the teaching of Jesus Christ. He's not doing the word. He hath not God. It literally says he is having, present tense, on an ongoing basis, not God. 
You can't have God and be transgressing at the same time. You can't have God and not be abiding in his word, the teaching that he's given. But then he says, he that's abiding in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son, because it's developing a personal, intimate fellowship with the Father and the Son, and you are getting to come to the place of knowing him and walking in his ways. God wants us to overcome all of these areas. So what's the results here of lawlessness and unrighteousness? We've seen several of these already. As far as if you let lawlessness get a hold of you, the result will be your love will wax cold. It'll happen. Well, I don't want it to. It doesn't matter. It'll happen. But if you walk according to the word, you will never get that way. You are going to be filled up with the word. God's going to do this great work in your life. And of course, what else? The guy who's walking in lawlessness, working lawlessness continually, what's he going to hear? Depart from me. We don't want to hear any depart from me stuff. And what about the results of unrighteousness? You know, you hear, the message like this brings the fear of God upon us because we want to make sure that we're walking right. Notice what he said. He was in the bond of unrighteousness. That's bondage. You're held in captivity. You're in bondage if you're in unrighteousness. Sin brings bondage. Many people have this bondage in areas of their life. That's why we need, we'll talk about how we can break all this and get free of it in a moment. Romans 1, 18, what else is going to happen? Wrath of God is going to be revealed against all the ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men. What else did we see? We saw that if, we walk, if we're unrighteous, are we going to inherit the kingdom of God? No, it's not going to happen. What else do we see? The guy who was walking in unrighteousness, he said, I, am, I don't know who you are, he said. He said, depart from me, workers of unrighteousness. What else happens to him? This is just all the scriptures we've already seen. The results. 2 Peter 2.9, we're just going through them quickly. The guy who is unjust or unrighteous, he's going to be punished in the day of judgment. We, can't have, we don't want that. We can't be walking in these wrong kind of ways. We see also, even over in Acts 24, verse 15, we have hope towards God, which they themselves also allow that there is a resurrection of the dead. There is. Both of the just, well, they're going to be unto eternal life, but also of the unjust, the unrighteous, and they're going to be punished, remember. There is a resurrection of those. We also see, as we saw the scriptures, that the guy who's building his house through unrighteousness, he's not doing things God's way. He's doing it his own way or whatever he wants to do. What's he say? Woe unto him. <laughs> he's in trouble. We can't be building our house the wrong way whatsoever. And what else did we see in Romans chapter 2 in verse 8? that is. We saw what happens to the guy who's obeying unrighteousness. He's got indignation. He's got wrath coming upon him. He's got tribulation. He's got anguish. All kinds of afflictions and calamities coming upon him. We can't have that whatsoever. We must turn away from all of these evil things. In fact, we even see over in 2 Peter chapter 2, Verse 13, there's a reward for righteousness, but there's also a reward for unrighteousness. <laughs> that sounds like not a very good reward. That's right, it's a bad reward. These guys who are walking contrary to the way of the Lord, they rejected his ways, they're going to receive the reward of unrighteousness. As they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime, spots they are, blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. That meant there were people in the church that they were allowing in them, they were having fellowship with them, and they weren't walking right. That's why we cannot have fellowship with people who are not walking right whatsoever. And we also saw in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, remember, 
What was the end result for all those ones that were deceived of righteousness? They're on the perishing road. And what happens to them? They're going to get the strong delusion to believe the lie, and the result's going to be they're going to be judged who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's why we can't have those things whatsoever. Now, it's important to realize that before the end comes, before the judgment comes to the nations, remember what happens first. The judgment comes to the church. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17 says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. That's the church. If it first begin at us, see, many people think that the Oh, they're just figuring that, well, you know, the judgment will come on the nations, not realizing there's a judgment coming to the church first. What shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Of course, they're finished for sure. Look what it says. If the righteous, those are the ones who are walking in line with the word in the church, scarcely, what does that mean? Scarcely is a word which means with difficulty and not easily. So you've got to resist. You've got to resist all sin. You've got to stand up for what's right. You cannot compromise. You're going to have to crucify that flesh. You're going to put away all the things that are not of him. You're going to separate yourself from the things of this world, even though you're in this world, but you're going to walk according to heaven's ways. The righteous, with difficulty and not easily, are being saved. Not that they have already are saved. Why do you say that? because it's a present tense verb. Are being saved. By who? By the Lord, because we're walking in righteousness. And we know it's the Lord doing it because it's a passive voice, meaning someone else is doing this action of being saved to the righteous. Who's doing it? God is, as we're walking in line with the word. Worse are the ungodly and the sinner, or the sinful ones, this means, What's going to happen to them? They're going to be in trouble. Judgment is going to come to the church before it comes to the world. You and I are to walk in his ways and see him accomplish everything that he wants in our life. Because what's ahead for us? 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. That is a crown of righteousness to be given to us which the Lord, the righteous judge, who's going to judge everybody, shall give me that day, and not to me only, but also all to those that love is appearing. Now, who's the crown of righteousness for? It's for those who are walking in his ways that have the fruits of righteousness. Remember, Philippians chapter 1, verse 11, he's praying for the church at Philippi, and he says that they're to be being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ, the glory and praise of God. And the fruits of righteousness are because we're doing the word of righteousness. And we see all this tremendous fruit in our life, which is what God wants. In fact, it's interesting. Who are the ones that are in heaven? This is, it tells you who's there. Hebrews 12, 23, to the general assembly and church of, of firstborns, Remember the word, there's no a de definite article, the, there, and the word firstborn in the Greek is plural. So we've got to go down to verse 23, where it sees it. Here is the word for firstborn, you see, and it's plural, meaning that it's not talking about the church of the firstborn referring to Jesus. It's talking about who's all a part of the church. Firstborns, every one of us, if we're firstborns. So the general assembly and church of firstborns, which are written in heaven to God, the judge of all. Remember, he's the one who judges us. And what does he, what does his judgment produce? It produces those are the real ones that are his. To the spirits of righteous men, the righteous. This word means the righteous. Made Perfect, come to perfection. How do we come to perfection? By doing the word of righteousness, producing the fruits of righteousness, because righteousness produces holiness in our life. And that's how we go on to perfection in the Lord. 
A lot of people say, perfection in the Lord? Well, that's exactly where we're headed. Ephesians chapter 4, look what it says in verse 11. He gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. These are the real ones. Not the ones that are just teaching you a scripture and then rambling or telling you jokes or seeker sensitive or just going to tell you whatever they want their opinion is. <laughs> no. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all might come, not automatic, it's a subjunctive mood verb, meaning it's conditional, might come into the unity of the faith and to the precise, correct knowledge of the Son of God. We've got to get the word exactly. And what all is this going to produce? To the perfect man, perfection. Unto the measure of the stature, this word stature is a metaphor referring to of the attained state. We come to that attained state of perfection, of the fullness of Christ. The fullness of Christ is coming into you and me through the Word in us. God is doing a work in you to change you, to transform you, to heal you, to deliver you, and you're going to get cleansed of everything that's not of Him. You're going to cast out all the demons. You're going to get set free from every bondage. You're going to get filled up with the things of God, and you're going to have fruits of righteousness unto holiness to see the fullness of Christ manifest in us in these last days. That is what's going to happen. In fact, who are the ones that are up in the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven? We do have to take a look and see. Is it just anybody who was born again at one point? No. Look what he says. Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. See, when we get raptured and get caught up to meet the Lord in the area, air, then we go up to heaven and we are in the marriage. His wife has made herself ready. Well, that meant she had to do something to be ready for the marriage, ready and prepared. To her was granted she should be arrayed in fine linen. Why would she be given fine linen? Clean, white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Who's up there? The righteous ones. Who's the one that may, comes into the eternal age after the new heavens and the new earth are eliminated? It's the righteous ones. Only the righteous are going to be in the new heavens and the new earth. And the righteous are the ones, remember, who are doing righteousness. They're born again and they're doing the word of righteousness. Look what it says in 1 John 3, 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that is doing Young's brings it out. Present tense. Righteousness is righteous. See, the deception is that every, oh, we're born again and that's all we got to do. Uh, no, that's the doorway in. Now you're going to walk the straight and narrow way. Now you're going to do what his word says. Now you're going to go through the cleansing process. If we don't go through the cleansing process, can we ever come to the place of being holy? No. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having, forth, having therefore these promises, all the promises that God will bring forth in our life, does that mean we're just, he's, he's going to bring them to pass automatically? No. Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. And this again is a subjunctive mood verb. Why is this subjunctive mood important? Because it's stating things that are conditional when conditions have to be met to see them come to pass. They're not facts. They're not going to automatically happen. Let us cleanse ourselves. We have to meet the condition from all filthiness of the flesh. Every fleshly work's got to be eliminated. And spirit. What's the filthiness of the spirit? It's not our spirit. There's no filthiness in the spirit of Jesus Christ. What is it? It's all the evil spirits that have come in. Their general term is unclean spirits. Filthy, unclean spirits. And what's that going to produce? Perfecting holiness and the fear of God. What kind of a church is presented to Jesus? Just whoever's born again? No, it doesn't say that, does it? 
Ephesians chapter 5 tells us who's going to be presented unto him. Verse 27. Well, we go back to verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it. Having been sanctified and cleansed with a washing of water by the word, he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot, no spots. And remember, you can, you're not to have your garment spotted by the flesh. That means all the fleshly works are eliminated or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. Who does the work in you? God does. Some people, when they see this, they think, you mean to tell me I got to make myself be this way? God does the work in you. You can do nothing of yourself. If you do the word, then he accomplishes the work in you. Our job is hear and do, hear and do the word. Obey. Work out your own salvation by always obeying, and you'll see God accomplish this great work in you and accomplish these great things. Well, and then what's going to happen? He's going to give us rewards. At the end, we're going to be rewarded. Look, when Jesus comes back, look what it says in Revelation 22, verse 12, first of all. Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Well, that's good news for the righteous. That's bad news for the ones that aren't right. Because look what he says the verse before. He that's unjust, unrighteous, let him be unjust still. He'll stay in that state and he'll be said, depart from me. He that's filthy, let him be filthy still. God doesn't take away your filthiness when he comes. You have had, uh, had it already taken away because you cleanse yourself. He that's righteous, let him be righteous still. He that's holy, let him be holy still. We're going to be the holy righteous ones. We aren't going to be the unjust or the filthy ones, that's for sure. We're going to get rid of it all. That's why we must do the things that he says to conquer everything and put the word of God first place in our life. That brings us, what do we need to do? Of course, we get born again. What else do we do? We got to meet the conditions of 1 John 1, 9. Dealing with all sin, as we talked about. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As I mentioned this morning, I'll mention it again tonight, this is one of the most misunderstood verses because it's not translated correctly. There are three subjunctive verbs in this verse. If we confess, that would be a conditional statement. You can tell that because if, that means it's a condition. We have to meet the condition of confessing our sins, subjunctive mood. He is faithful and he is righteous. Remember, he judges according to righteousness. Then it says to forgive us our sins. It looks like it just automatically gets done because I confess my sin. That's wrong because it, there's not an infinitive there. Just as English, in English, there's also in Greek, infinitives. Watch what this is when I put the cursor over the word forgive. It looks like to forgive is an infinitive. It's not an infinitive. It is a subjunctive mood verb. This is why we put Young's up here. Young's literal translation is the best that I know of, in the New Testament especially. He is faithful and just that he may forgive us the sins if we meet the conditions. Well, what conditions would that be? Not just confessing them only. You've got to have, to have a godly sorrow that works repentance and turn away from them and not walk in them any longer. And also, to cleanse us. It looks like it's another one of these infinitives. It's not. We put the cursor over the word cleanse and you see it below. That's why this is a tremendous program that we use to show you what's truly said in the Greek. It's a subjunctive mood. Same thing, conditional statement. That he may cleanse us from all or every unrighteousness. Conditional. So who's the one who's going to be right with God? The one who confesses his sins? The one who gets gets rid of all the sin because he get, turns away from it and he gets cleansed from all the effects of the sin, which is unrighteousness. Continuing in it. That's why, of course, we just gave that scripture. 
2 Corinthians 7. What do we do? We got all these great promises. We must cleanse, remember, the subjunctive mood from all the filthiness of the flesh and spirit. We get rid of every fleshly work. We get rid of every evil spirit. We put off all the works of the flesh. We get rid of the anger, the resentment, the bitterness, the evil speaking. We get rid of every work of the flesh. It's not going to be a part of our life whatsoever. And we're going to cast out all the demons to get rid of all these evil spirits out of us so that they won't drive us to commit sin. And we're going to perfect holiness in the fear of God. That is what we must come to that place of. And that's what he wants. You see, the Word of God is powerful and mighty. It will work greatly in your life if you'll just hear and do it. Think of all the things that God has done in your life already. It's all been from the working of the Word that you've heard and done. Well, have confidence He'll do everything. Psalms 119.1 Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep His testimonies that seek Him with a whole heart. They also do no unrighteousness. They walk in His ways. We're not going to walk and do unrighteousness. You're going to do righteousness only. We're not going to do unrighteousness. We're eliminating that. We're getting rid of all unrighteousness out of our life. And remember, there's going to be a remnant who will do what God wants. God's will is for everybody to walk right. Unfortunately, only a remnant's going to do it. Look what it says about a remnant. Zephaniah 3.13, the remnant of Israel shall do not do unrighteousness, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found on their mouth. We're not going to do any of these things. The remnant who are going to follow the way of the Lord are going to put the word of God first place. And what are we going to do? We're going to make sure that we are vessels of honor. What determines what kind of vessel you are? It's what you do with the word of God. Look what it says in 2 Timothy 2.19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God, how's that laid in your life? By hearing and doing the word consistently. Stands sure. This means strong, um, firm, immovable, solid. Nothing can move it. That's what's going to get laid in your life, this foundation as you hear and do the word. Having this seal, a seal is talking about something that's confirmed, proved, and shown to be authenticated. In other words, you're the real deal. God's going to prove every one of us. In fact, we need to prove ourselves that we're the real deal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. Well, that also implies there must be those that aren't His. He knows the ones that are His are the ones that are walking His ways. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from unrighteousness, adikia. How can we name the name of Christ and think we're right and we're walking in sin? Who are we kidding? <laughs> we're, we're just pl 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 have a religious you know, attitude. We can't be walking in those ways. In a great house, there's not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth and some to honor and some to dishonor or a disgrace. What determines whether you are a vessel of honor or a vessel of disgrace? Is it God just arbitrarily deciding you're one of this and you're one of that? No. Look what it says. If a man, that's you and me, therefore purges, cleanse out, cleanse thoroughly, the cleansing process must be accomplished. And is this automatic? No. We see that subjunctive mood again. There's over 1,400 subjunctive moves. I went through and typed out every single one of them because I see how important the subjunctive mood is. You've got to know it. Additional statements. If a man, therefore, might cleanse thoroughly, cleanse out himself from these, from the unrighteousness, it depends on whether you go through the cleansing process. He shall be a vessel unto honor. See, who's going to do the work? God is. But you have a part to play. 
He's not going to cast the demons out of you without your participation. You're going to cast them out. He's not going to make you deny yourself. You're going to deny yourself. He's not going to make you put off all the works of the flesh. You're going to put off the works of the flesh by his power through the word and get cleansed. What's going to happen? You're going to be sanctified. Well, that means made holy, doesn't it? And how has that happened? That's because God has completed this work in the past with present results now, meaning that's the way you live. Why do we say that? Because this is a perfect tense. I, write, I type out all the perfect tense ones, too. <laughs> You've got to know them all. <laughs> Here he says, the perfect tense, remember, is action completed in the past with present results at the time of speaking, showing the track record of what he is. Having been sanctified in the past, and that's the way this guy is now, that's the way you and I are to be. Because we went through the cleansing process. That's why dealing with everything is so important and casting out the demons is so important. It's a process. That's why we do it every Saturday. And we will always do it. Continually casting out the spirits to drive them out. And encouraging you to get in the Word, correct every problem, do the Word, and, and walk uprightly and see the fruits of righteousness come forth in your life. This guy's a vessel of honor, having been sanctified in the past, with present results now. He's meat for the master's use. He's prepared unto every good work. How do you think the mighty army of the Lord, the perfected church, is going to be raised up because they've done this? Ah, they're ready for the master's use. They're prepared unto every good work because God's done the work in us tremendous things that he is going to accomplish. Great things will happen. We need to be those who are righteous and holy before him. Look what it says in Luke 16, verse 10. He that's faithful and just in that which is least is faithful also in much. You know, we, we do what he says and we become faithful, showing this is the way we are consistently. But he that's unjust in the least is unjust also in much. You can't afford any injustice in you. It'll carry over into everything you do. We've got to be doing what he says. If therefore you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? He won't. It won't happen. If you've been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? That means we've got to take care of things that other people's see. We can't be serving two masters, mammon, which is riches, and God. No, we're going to serve God. Oh, the Pharisees, they were covetous. That really got them. <laughs> they couldn't take that. They were mad about it because of what had happened. God wants us to come to the place of walking in his ways. We want to be those who do the work. Look what he says. Well, well, thou good servant, because you've been faithful enough very little, have authority over ten cities. Is he just going to give anybody authority over the cities? No. Only the ones who have been faithful. And what have we been faithful to do? We've been faithful to do the things he said. We're going to get rid of all lawlessness and all unrighteousness. We're going to get filled up with the word of God. We're going to go through the cleansing process and get rid of everything that is not of God. There's no compromise. There's no untouchable areas. Everything in your life is to be laid on the table. Not of God. Out of here. <laughs> That's it. Thoughts? No. I'm taking those thoughts captive. That's not going on in my life anymore. Attitudes? <laughs> That's an ungodly attitude. That's got to go. No unforgiveness, resentment, bitterness, anger, these kind of things. Having attitudes, jealous, you know, whatever it might be, lustful, so forth. They all got to go. Everything needs to be purged out. God's doing that work in you through the Word. Just hear and do the Word. Just be steadfast in it. God has done to do the, all the work. Think what He's done in your life so far. Well, why wouldn't He do the to total work? Of course He will. Have confidence in him and know that he will bring it to pass. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you 
that I am going to do what your word says. I will conquer all unrighteousness, all lawlessness, everything that is not of you will be purged and cleansed out and eliminated from my life. I will be a doer of the word of righteousness, bringing forth fruits of righteousness, producing holiness. I will cleanse myself of all filthiness of the flesh and all the evil spirits as I cast them out. I thank you that it perfects holiness in the fear of God. I thank you that as I go through the cleansing process to be a vessel of honor, I will be sanctified, holy before you, one of the righteous ones. I thank you for accomplishing this great work because I am a hearer and a doer of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we all have ears to hear about all these messages that have come forth and that we are doers of this word and we are getting rid of all unrighteousness and lawlessness. We're not going to let it get on us and we know it's going to abound in these days and the deceitfulness of it and all the things that are going to happen, the abounding of lawlessness. It's not going to be on us. We're putting the word first place, walking in it and see your total work be done, that we're going on to perfection. Thank you, Father, for accomplishing this great work in each one of us because we are hearers and doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.